right, so today we're going to go through the um, both the sitting and supine position of the cardiovascular exam, um, as well as measuring JVP, how to go about measuring JVP, and then evaluating peripheral pulses, uh, peripheral vessels. Um, this will follow the pulmonary. So if you notice that pulmonary stopped at 18 with the special tests, your patient will already be in that sitting position, right? So I've just done egophony or bronchophony, whatever I've done, um, and then I'm going to go right into um, the sitting position exam. The first article is auscultating the carotids. So we need to auscultate the carotids. Remember that it's done with the bell. First, I want to kind of get a position. So if you put your chin up for me, right? So gently palpate until we evaluate for bruise. Gently palpate the carotid artery. Now, I'm going to have my patient take a deep breath in and hold it. And I'm going to listen. Okay, good. Once again, take a deep breath in, hold it. Good. So I'm listening for uh, bruies. So I'm going to tell you that this, I said, please hold your breath while I'm listening for uh, carotid bruies. There are no carotid bruies here. Okay. Now, auscultation of the heart. We've talked about it in lecture, but now let's take a look at uh, the, the topical anatomy, right? Um, in regards to like doing inspection, we always talk about doing inspection first. That's been completed previously in the, uh, just before the, uh, the pulmonary, right? So we're moving right through. Let's talk about the topical uh, topography of the chest. We know that we have the sternal notch. And below the sternal notch is the manubrium and the sternal angle, or the angle of Louis. At the angle of Louis, we have the second rib that attaches at the angle of Louis, and just below that second rib is the second intercostal space. That's going to be important for our auscultation. So we need to know the second intercostal space, our third, there's our third rib, so our third intercostal space, fourth rib, fourth intercostal space, our fifth rib, fifth intercostal. The other thing we need to know is the midclavicular line that's on our patient as well. Okay? So we're going to go through with the diaphragm, we're going to listen to all four valvular positions, and we're going to look at the left third intercostal space, which is termed Herb's point. Okay, so we're going to name the valves as we go through. I like going through with the diaphragm first. So my second intercostal space on the right side is my aortic. Straight over is my pulmonic. Third inner space, herbs. Fifth intercostal space along the left sternal border is my tricuspid. And then just lateral in the midclavicular line, fifth intercostal space, mitral valve. I leave my stethoscope on, I change to the bell, and I just go in reverse. Fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line, mitral. Fifth intercostal space, left sternal border, tricuspid. Third intercostal space, left sternal border, herbs. Second intercostal space, left sternal border, pulmonic. Second intercostal space, right sternal border, aortic. Good. Um, so I say at this point, it's just a matter of naming as I go through. That's your key indicator of performance there, okay? Now, I'm going to auscultate uh, with inspiration here. And remember, that's we were talking about the physiologic split of S2. Some will have you take a deep breath and hold it, but taking a deep breath and listening will split the S2. And we did a little audi audi uh, audio in the classroom. It's a very quick split. It's not like an S3 that has a longer duration between the two sounds. It's a very quick split. So I'm listening with my diaphragm. Second intercostal space, third intercostal space. First thing I do is I want to listen to the heart sound. The most important thing here, like I was saying before, you close your eyes and you start getting into the music of the heart, so to speak. So the heart's loved up, loved up, loved up. 
once I get that in, and I'm hearing it, I understand, I'm, I'm really listening to it close. I want you to take a deep breath. Hold it. And let it out. Take another deep breath. And let it go. I definitely heard it the second time. Right? So he does have a physiologic split. It's very close. But you've got to train your ears first. You've got to find out what is S1 and S2. And then once you figure out what S1, S2 is, and you get the beat in your head, then have them take a deep breath. It might be the second or third inspiration that they're kind of taking a deep one that you'll actually start hearing it split. Okay? So I'm listening for a physiologic split of S2, or you can say there is a phys physiologic split of S2. Now we're going to auscultate with the diaphragm in the third intercostal space again over at Herbs. But this time, uh, we're going to do it with an expired breath. And what we're listening for is the murmur of aortic regurgitation. So back to Herbs' point we go. Again, love dub. Take a big breath in and hold it. Try it one more time if I didn't hear it. Another big breath in. Hold it. Okay, very good. So there is no murmur of aortic regurgitation. The important thing there is the deep breath. It's an expired air, and then um, the patient leans forward at the same time, right? Expired and lean forward. Um, now we're going to do the valve salve maneuver, and we're here. We're looking for that hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, right? The Hopkins. Uh, in Hokum's, we're going to have them stay upright, um, and then we're going to have them bear down like if you're moving your bowels, okay? So I'm going to tell you to bear down, if you'll just bear down for me. Again, in Herb's point, and bear down. Okay, and breathe. Bear down one more time. Okay, and breathe. You know, you can actually... You don't have a murmur, that's good. But I'll tell you that you can actually hear the intensity of the heartbeat as it goes, right? So as we bring on that, that preload or we engorge that ventricle, you can actually hear it, even if there's no hope. Okay. So we're gonna bring our bed up, right? Um, right to 30 degrees, about 30 degrees. I'm gonna stay on the right side. I'm gonna bring up the leg. On this exam, I'm going to have my patient turn their head to the left because I want to measure the right inter, uh, the jugular, the right jugular, right internal. Remember we had talked about the sternocleidomastoid. We have the clavicular head lies on one side, and then the sternal head lies uh, medial. Okay. When I, if I'm having a hard time actually seeing those heads to get my landmarks, I can actually take my finger just to his chin and have him turn to my chin. And you can actually see the sternocleidomastoid heads actually accentuate, right, with resistance. So gentle pressure. So I kind of know my landmark. So at this point, at 30 degrees, I'm going to actually start inspecting for um, um, any pulsations along that pathway. Remember that the internal jugular follows this pathway, right, to the angle of the jaw. So at this time, I'm going to look. I don't really see much at all, and I don't expect to see much in, in a healthy patient, right? I really don't because I'm, what am I evaluating here? I'm evaluating the right atrium, right? Or the right ventricle, I'm sorry, the right ventricle to make sure that the right ventricle is functioning properly. So for him, it looks fine. Let's pretend that we had um, an, a pulse that comes just below this mark on his neck, right? That would be my meniscus, and it would be a pulse waveform that travels up with an oscillation each time it travels up. So once I find that waveform, I come to the angle of Louis, right? I'm gonna actually use my centimeter side facing my patient. I place that on my angle of Louis, and at the top of the oscillation, with a straight edge, is where I'll measure my jugular venous pressure. And our number would have been two centimeters, right? Two centimeters. 
that tells me that his right ventricle is not congested and it's, produ it's performing appropriately because the cutoff is three. Three and less is a normal JVP, higher than three suggests uh, congestion. If he had congestion, blood backup, because the muscles aren't working so well, they would have something called jugular venous distension. JVD, it's, a not, it's an invisible thing. There's a PowerPoint slide with a picture, and it's just this huge internal jugular vein that's kind of popping out of his neck, right? At the top of that big congested vessel is an oscillatory move. The, the oscillation, you'll see the top of that oscillation. That's where it's moving. Remember that it has two waveforms, not one like a carotid artery, but two waveforms. So that's why I was saying let's pretend that it actually goes to the top right here, this little mark on his neck. Let's pretend that this is where we see the top of that oscillation. He has obvious JVD that I can see. He has peripheral edema, he's short of breath, and he has some chest pain. Those things suggest we have right-sided failure, probably maybe even left-sided failure, but definitely right-sided. So at this point, I see the oscillation. I want to go to the sternal angle, right? The sternal angle on his chest. Once I go to the sternal angle, I'm going to put my measuring device, whatever it is, but it should be in centimeters, right on the sternal angle. Once I have it placed on the sternal angle, I'm looking at the top of the oscill oscillation, and I'm going to take my straight edge. It's not so straight anymore. But I'm going to take my straight edge, and I'm going to place my straight edge straight to the top of the oscillation and to my measuring device. And yours is now... 2.5 centimeters. He's still within normal limits, right on? Even though I've moved him up. I would expect that oscillatory thing. As I move him up, if already a third spaced a lot of volume, I might have to move him up a little higher, right? Or excuse me, if he's volume overloaded, I would have to move him up a little higher if he's volume overloaded, right, to move that oscillation. As I move him down, what would happen to my meniscus? starting to settle back into the chest, yes? Yeah? So it's important that we describe the angle that we have our patient. Is he at 30 degrees? JVP measured two centimeters above the sternal angle at 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees. So we have to report what angle we have our patient at what measure. So after we measure JVP, we're gonna inspect the precordium at this point. Okay, and we're inspecting for precordial heaves at points of maximal impulse that we can actually see. We're going to palpate the precordium and we're going to locate the PMI. Okay, so when I palpate the precordium, it's with the balls of my hand just like so. Right? I want to hit the valvular areas, herbs point, tricuspid, mitral. Okay? Now, I'm also going to try to find the PMI. Where am I going to find the PMI? Do you remember? It's the fifth intercostal space. It's the fifth intercostal space, and where in the fifth intercostal? Midclavicular. It could be it could be medial or just anterior or lateral to it, no, but, but not by much. So to find it, I'm going to place my hand on his chest. Let's pretend that I found it right in the midclavicular line. I would march these fingers to that point. It's still under those two fingers. And then I'm going to use my uh, index finger to calculate the size. Remember that the size should be less than a quarter, the size of a quarter, right? You can also use this maneuver to try to find the PMI. I'm going to have you lay on the left side. It's called a lateral, um, left lateral decubitus, right? So the same thing. I wanted to bring the apex of the heart a little closer to the wall. I'm going to lean you way over. Palpate. Found it. I palpate it, and then to one quarter size. Okay, good. Lay back over. So there are no lifts, heaves, or thrills, and the PMI is non-displaced. If it was displaced, it would be lateral. It could also you can actually find PMIs uh, in the xiphoid region, right towards that right atrium, the heart, especially when the heart tilts. Typically, you can find that in like very thin or COPD patients. You can find it here, right? His is non-displaced. Now we're going to auscultate the heart with the diaphragm at those four valvular positions again, in this position. So second intercostal space, 
second intercostal space on the right. Aorta. Second intercostal space on the left. Pulmonic. Third intercostal space is Herb's point. Fourth, in, or excuse me, fifth intercostal space is the tricuspid. Fifth intercostal space on the left, mitral. Backwards now with the bell. Fifth intercostal space on the left, midclavicular, mitral. Fifth intercostal left sternal border, tricuspid. Third inner space on the left sternal border, herbs. Second intercostal, pulmonic. Right, second intercostal, aortic. So at that point, I just went through and mentioned what I did. Right? I went through and named my valves, my valvular areas, and there's point four gallops. Right? We're listening for those gallops. So I'm going to put him in his left lateral decubitus position one more time. Right? And I'm taking a listen. It's midclavicular. Right? Back in um, the supine position, there are no gallops. There's no gallops or S3 or S4 heard. Okay? So that's important that it's bell and it's left lateral decubitus. Once I've finished with my exam, like when I finish that, just like we did with pupils equal rounds of reactive delight and accommodation, we had this little saying here that we would say that the rate and rhythm are regular without murmurs, gallops, or rubs. After we evaluate for gallops, correct? All right, now, we've pretty much done the cardiac portion of the cardiovascular, but now we still have the periphery, the peripheral vascular portion of the exam. So we're going to palpate the, um, the peripheral arteries or the pulses. We've already done the carotids, right? But the brachials, like I was saying before, they can be done um, symmetrically together. So my brachials, let's see. Brachial arteries. Radial. We would mention the femorals, but we don't need to examine the femorals, but we mention femorals, they're important. I'm going to take both legs up, the popliteal. Then there's the posterior tibialis. You can see my hand position, right? It lies behind the medial malleolus. Then I can have my patient flex his big toe and relax. This is my dorsalis pedis. Checking my pulses. And then I would report pulses are full and equal bilaterally. And then I'm going to check the nail beds and fingers and toes for cyanosis and clubbing. Right? Cap refills less than two seconds. There's no central or uh, peripheral cyanosis or clubbing noted. And then I'm going to check um, the lower vessels, right? The peripheral vessels. We're going to check those by inspecting and palpating the legs. We're looking for edema, hair distribution, skin condition, temperature, and varicosities. And we use the back of our hands to compare the temperature of legs. So um, I would say I'm inspecting for edema, hair distribution, skin condition, temperature, and varicosities. So when I go through first, I really want to look at his legs, right? I really want to take a look and see if I can find some. Uh, edema or any tender spots, variscosities for sure, right? No edema. And then I'm looking at the hair distribution of his legs. Remember we talked about toes, right? Circulation, great circulation. And then the back of my hands is how I want to feel temperature, right? I want to make sure that there's no um, um, fever or anything to the feet. 